One of the great joys for me in the creation of our services is the selection of the art that accompanies us each week on our journey. For me, the art is imp as important as it is for Dr. Harris and the music, for Christoph and the music, for Michael and liturgy, for all of us putting these pieces together. I have to admit, I have a special place in my heart for the art. I love art, and so nothing makes me happier than finding a painting that fits like a glove with our theme each Sunday, because I know the power of art and how it can lead us to the holy. Marc Chagall, whose painting graces our cover today, is one of my favorite artists. Over the span of his life and storied career, the world as it was known changed drastically several times. Born in Belarus, Chagall lived during the time of the Russian Revolution and witnessed and survived the First and Second World Wars. The terrible events leading up to World War II put Chagall in extreme danger. In 1937, as a high-profile Jew, he was targeted as the Nazi officials purged and burned German museums of works the party considered to be degenerate. As Hitler and the Nazi regime became more erratic and more powerful, there was nowhere safe in Europe for a famed Jewish artist. In the midst of the drumbeat to war and the unbelievable horrors that were still unknown and yet feared, a U.S. journalist, Varian Fry, ran a covert operation that rescued artists, intellectuals, and authors from Nazi-occupied Germany and all of Europe. Because of that covert operation, Chagall and his wife were able to come to America it was an opportunity that not everyone who was in danger was able to grasp. But make no mistake, the Chagalls were refugees. The Chagalls were immigrants looking for safety and shelter without fear. Their lives were saved because Mark Chagall was an artist. And Chagall would go on to paint the incredible masterpieces that somehow found the holy in pain and suffering and in joy and beauty throughout the rest of his life. The painting for today comes from an earlier and happier time when he was a young man in Belarus a time when it seemed everything was possible, and Chagall looked at and reimagined life from every angle. In our fall series on reimagining the Ten Commandments today, we come to the Third Commandment. The traditional reading of that commandment is, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Well, growing up, using the name of God in any way, shape, or form that remotely sounded like something and that went against that third commandment was considered high treason in our house. My mother simply would not tolerate it. It did not matter if you were her children, someone else's children, a relative, a neighbor, landscapers, or construction workers, or someone who had the good fortune to be invited to our house for dinner. Now bear in mind, my mother was only four foot ten, and she was small, but she was mighty. And when she corrected you about using God's name in vain, there was no doubt you had been corrected. While faith was such a huge part of our life, I will admit, I found this highly irritating. You could say certain things. If you were really upset or mad, you could get away with, damn it, but not with God, damn it. And saying Jesus Christ, unless you were talking about the difference Jesus Christ was making in your life, meant you were really in trouble. 
So I was extremely careful to only learn cuss words that weren't even close to God's name. Fortunately, through the years, I have found a lot of those. <laughs> like so many things found in the Bible for millennia, people have found a way to not take God's name in vain. And yet, at the same time, they have found a ton of ways to use God's name for other less than holy ideas. The third commandment is reimagined by our friends at Enfleshed, and it goes beyond simply using God's name in vain. I found it astonishing to rethink their use of these ancient words in the light of our time and place as simply, do not use God's name to do harm. One way to understand this commandment is to imagine it as, don't try to make God an accomplice to your wrongdoing. So much unimaginable injustice is done in the name of God every day. And throughout the ages, religion has managed to theologically justify some of the worst atrocities the world has known in God's name. It is amazingly easy for leaders with a lust for power to use the name of God, to use the Bible to marshal and militarize people. And we have been doing this for far too long. We've been doing it for so long that we now believe this upside-down view is normal. But not only normal, normal and righteous. The Chagall painting for today, The Holy Coachman, is not readily understandable when we first look at that figure hurtling down and sliding like a sleigh across the snowy field. Looking closely, we can see the little flaming coronet, the Jewish prayer cap, on the coachman's head. And together with the domed church, the work does suggest something holy. But an interesting reality of this work is that the picture is upside down. At the Berlin exhibition of 2014, the curator, following some impulse, hung the picture the wrong way up. So Chagall, struck by the unexpected apparition of the profane angel bursting upon the scene, accepted the inversion and from then on kept it this way. We have gotten so used to, to God's name being used in an upside down way that we have forgotten. Our job in this life is to search for the way of God rather than using God so that we can impose our own way in God's name. We have been looking at the Ten Commandments in such an upside-down way for so long that we cannot imagine what they actually were in the time they were written or what they can be in our time and place now. They carry so much baggage that it is easy to believe abandoning them totally is the only possible course of action. Yet we can learn from the history of God's relationship to communities past. We can learn about who God is, what God longs for, how God nurtures life and love and justice. And from the narratives of the scriptures, we can learn about what happens when we cling to power more than we hold on to love. If we are open to what it means to be wise in the ways of God, 
we can begin to understand the changing nature of life in God over time and context. But when we believe the past is still present, we turn the beauty of faith upside down and we make a stronghold. We take a stand using the idols of God, of the Bible, and the Ten Commandments. And then we use those idols we have now made in our own image as weapons. Weapons that harm God's beloved children. Fortunately, God continues to be in relationship with all life and in all times and all places. It is the responsibility of each life and each community to find its own way according to who they are and what the world needs most. All of the scriptures, all of the commandments, all of the stories from the past help us to discern our present and our particular relationships to God. So we must ask ourselves, what in this unique time defines our own relationship to God in our community and in our own particular time and place? And then we ask, what now is ours to do? I realize it is hard some days to believe change is coming. Yet even in the midst of the mess we see right now, I am hopeful. Because I know from experience how amazing life can be when we come together and imagine that God is, in fact, freedom and liberation. I know what can happen when we ground our lives in mutual care and connectedness. I know what can happen when we open our doors and our hearts to save all the Mark Chagalls of this world, whether or not they are artists. When that happens, we can see the hope in the miracles just waiting for us to pick up the ball and run with it. I love all the stories of hope these days. People are saying yes to different ways to live in the present, a way that is bound in using the name of God not for harm, but the love that knows our greatest call is to care for one another. The governor of a northern state said recently as a response to the pressure to hang the stone tablets in schools, we don't have Ten Commandments posted in our classrooms, but we do have free lunch and breakfast. In this place, we gather together each week, believing we share with God and with each other a vision of a world made new a world that includes the belovedness of each one of us and yet is bigger than any single life. You see, the kingdom of God becomes a collective reality when we embrace bringing and sharing our gifts to the God who is our co-worker in creating a more just, more compassionate, more generous world for us all. God has given us one another to care for, to depend on, to befriend and struggle with. And there is work to be done. I am so thankful we get to do this work together. May it be so.